Father, we come before you and we thank you for fresh air <laughs> and a beautiful day. Uh, thank you. It's not torrentially raining as it has been for quite a few weeks. Lord, once again, as we go through your word, you've written these things for our learning and our admonition. And it sure is a lot easier to learn on somebody else's nickel at their expense than for us to go through the same thing. And so I do pray, Lord, for all who are here, as uh, we are nicely packed together with heat, that yet somehow their hearts and their minds are able to be open to your word, to your presence. And Lord, perhaps even again, only you can take one chapter and not only encourage the church, but correct where it's out of order. And Lord, speak to those who do not yet know you, that you have longed for a relationship with them and you're waiting for them to open their heart. So thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for uh, the hands helping you quickly to watch doors and make this work. But thank you, Lord, for a chance to gather freely and to proclaim your name and to hear your word without fear of persecution. Thank you for this wonderful country in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so to get into chapter 32, I have to remind you, because sometimes you forget context and sort of what was going on at the time. So chapter 19, just a brief look at this. And that is, if you remember, chapter 19 came to pass, verse 16, on the third day in the morning, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so all the people that were in the camp trembled. Verse 17, chapter 19 of Exodus, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount and the Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Chapter 20, and God spake while this is all happening, all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven or carved image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Okay, everybody remember all that? Wonderful, chapter 32. You may not remember at this point, because I know it takes eons for me to get through a book and we'll try to speed up and all that, but back in chapter 24, we learned that Moses was up on the mountain there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. How many remember the hurricane that hit Southern California, Hurricane Hillary? Okay, seriously, how many remember? Put your hands up, just so it proves it's not just me. Wow, most of you don't. For the first time in like 40 or 60 years, depending on which news and weather, uh, weather site you listen to, a hurricane hit the west coast of California. A lot of rain came down. Uh, I know because one of our daughters is in Malibu at Pepperdine, and so the popcorn ceiling in her room began to swell, 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 and then pop, and then water went everywhere, and she's still waiting for a room to be repaired. Uh, so we knew quite well about Hurricane Hillary and what was going on out there in the west coast. That was 40 days ago. So everybody got the time frame? And that's, okay, it's a weather event. And if you're there, it's obviously more impactful to you than if here on the West East Coast, you hear about it like, eh, it's, you know, it's West Coast, serves them right, right? Whatever. I mean, that's how, <laughs> how people think in the East. But this happened. If you are still in the same valley and pillar of cloud is still there and pillar of fire by night and mountain is still burning with smoke. How many of you would still be, should we say, connected to the event? 40 days, God's presence still being manifested. And we get to chapter 32. When the Lord saw, or sorry, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and they said unto him, up, or that's Yalak, let's go. Up, <clears throat> make us gods, plural, which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot, that's old King James, for no, that's Yada in the Hebrew, we know not what has become of him. 
And Aaron said unto the people, you shall have no other gods before him. You shall not bow down to any image of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the oceans around you. The Lord your God, did he say any of that? What's happening here is a test, see? And God is testing a number of things. Moses, Aaron, the people, all who are involved. It's a test. Let's see. Now, God says he knows the end from the beginning. We have a term for that. That's omniscient, knows everything. Does he know how this is going to go? Yes. The naysayer says, well, why is he testing them? Because the individuals being tested are learning about themselves. Just like when you go through tests, guess who gets schooled? You do. It's not like God goes, wow, that was really good. Never thought they'd prop the doors open. <laughs> the test is for us. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, 40 days. Remember, Moses sat there for six days waiting to go up in the presence of God. Seventh day of the Sabbath, he's finally able to go in. Had he not been in that waiting room, this would have probably not happened. Wait, well then God caused it. No, God set up the test. But they made their answers. They made their responses. And so when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which will go before us, for as for this man, Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know, or we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto the people, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and he, Yotzar is the idea, to fashion like a potter or to frame, he fashioned it with a graving tool. Now, if you take an object and you grave it with a graving tool, you create a graven object. Anybody, the only one here? Just, what are they not to bow down to? Graven objects, images. Rather than rebuke them, or at least reiterate the word of God to them, Aaron caves in. So by not giving to the people a reminder of what God said just 40 days before, in a rather overwhelming multimedia experience, which they have none of that, rather than tell them what the word of God says, he gives the people what they want. And in giving the people what they want, it basically brings them to destruction and death. This problem, unfortunately, is not exclusive to Exodus 32 and Aaron and the people coming out of Israel or out of Egypt, going into Israel, become the land of Canaan. This problem is going on right now in our country where pulpits are no longer proclaiming what the word of God says. And so since they aren't being honest about, look, you're in a same sex relationship or you're in a heterosex relationship, both of these are judged by God. There's only one relationship sexually God will endorse, and that's between a husband and a wife starting on their wedding night till death do them part. And because they don't proclaim these things anymore, we've re redefined what marriage is and what's acceptable, and there are pulpits that are afraid to even tell people that, look, or, you know, this lifestyle, God has to judge, not just them, but even the heterosexual community, God has to judge if it's outside of the right confines of what he defined for marriage. And because they no longer tell the people the word of God says, as it says back in the book of Judges, every man is doing what they think is good in their own eyes. And what's that doing to our country? For example, you shall not steal. Now it's like, well, if you can get away with it. What's that doing to our country? You shall not murder. Well, if you hire the right team, maybe you can get away with it. What's that doing to our country? Because people are no longer saying, this is what God's word says. And if you want to be right with him, you better obey. And if you don't want to be right with him, you're going to destroy yourself. This is a problem. And Aaron fell right into it. So the people broke off their earrings. He took it. He fashioned it with a graving tool. He made a molten calf. And he said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar. By the way, I want to introduce to you, Aaron, you're soon to be high priest of the land of Israel. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And so they rose up early in the morrow, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, 
And all the people sat down. Wait a minute, what offering's missing? Burn offering, peace offering, sin offering. See, once again, when <clears throat> men and women are allowed to make a God in their image, it doesn't usually deal with sin. When I want God on my terms, often I don't want to deal with sin. The Greco-Roman mythology, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, if you study them, that's I'm not suggesting you do, but if you were stuck doing history and all that and you had to do it, you learn that the behaviors of their God, so-called, are more decadent often than the average person. And so when Zeus is you know, guilty of you know, whatever, and this one, and you've got sexual abuse and other things, and abduction and murder and all that going on within their gods and their pantheon, little wonder if the behavior of the people isn't much better. And that's what happens when people make God in their image. They say things like, well, if I were God, I would be okay with this. Well, you're not God, number one, and he's not okay with it, and you gotta decide where do you wanna spend eternity? That's the problem. And it always comes back to leaving the word of God. Let's ask ourselves a question. How did it go for Eve and then Adam in departing from the word of God? How many of you are enjoying wearing clothes right now? <laughs> go look it up if you don't understand. You'll find it in Genesis 3. Some of you are thinking, I'd rather be in clothes right now. Then. So this is what they did. And of course, as always, when we go through these things, the question is, or the accusation is, prove it. Okay, let's start proving it. This again, signs in Saudi Arabia. These are historical sites in Saudi Arabia, a long time jealously guarded, but things have been slipping gently, slowly out of their hands as smaller and smaller devices were able to capture it, get it out to the west. This has been our website, Finding the Mountain of Moses. Let's just remind ourselves of what the history of this was. A small handful of Americans tried to sneak into this area in the late 1970s and the 1980s. They were arrested and their photos and videos were confiscated by the Saudi police. Their evidence was lost. However, images and videos slowly began leaking out to the outside world. According to those who snuck in and were arrested, these sites were being kept secret by the Saudi regime, a theocracy that hid them from the world using fences and police and the threat of force. Okay, now you've seen this before, but I want to remind you, you had to crawl under a fence to get, in, to get into certain sites. And as we show you now the other high def footage, note the fence. Another major event by Mount Sinai is the incident with the golden calf. While Moses is up on Mount Sinai, some of his followers begin worshiping a golden calf. They place it up on a stand and begin worshiping around it and they set up an altar in front of it. When Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, he destroys the golden calf and sprinkles its remains into the river that comes down from the mountain. Here, in front of the mountain, we have the remains of what may have been that golden calf worship site. Now behind me in this fenced-in archaeological site that the Saudis are protecting, you see both a stand with many petroglyphs of cows and people worshiping cows, as well as a structure that is slightly lifted that may be the altar in front of the golden calf stand. There's a sign in Arabic and English warning intruders against going into the area. The local tradition that this is where the golden calf was is so strong that if you approach it, you'll be suspected of searching for gold. According to the Bible, the worshipers of the golden calf say, these are your gods, O Israel. This verse indicates that there are multiple depictions of bulls as the Israelites are worshiping the golden calf. On the top of the stand where the golden calf would have been placed, there is a circular indent where the rock has been worn down it's speculated that this is where Moses grounded the golden calf into powder. After Moses destroys the golden calf, 3,000 of the golden calf worshipers are killed, so there must be a spot where thousands of people were buried. About four miles from this site, there's a massive ancient graveyard. It appears to be a mass burial site where the graves were dug all at once. It's located just outside the plain where the Israelites would have camped, so it's exactly where it should be if this is where that story took place. 
Okay, so you remember we also had Dr. Todd Fink. Some of this again review, but he gives a good step back and look at the whole site. You'll notice tags to show you where the different things are, so it puts things in context that we're gonna go through in the next few verses. At the base of this mountain here is a large flat area where the Israelites could have camped. It is huge in size and had streams of water and pasture land for their livestock to graze. Also, the climate was perfect as it is higher in elevation, so it's not hot in the summer and it's comfortable in the winter. Next, Exodus 19:18 states that Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. The top of these mountains are dark, showing signs of burnt marks. The outer parts of the rocks are black, but on the inside, they are brownish in color. And you can see here, there's been some rocks that have been chipped away, and you can see that on the outside, they're black, and on the inside, they are brown. This seems to be more evidence that this mountain and the surrounding mountains close by were covered with fire and smoke. Okay, so now the perspective of where it happened. Another fascinating discovery at the base of this mountain is the altar upon which Aaron set the golden calf and all Israel worshiped before it. On the top of these rocks is the main rock that shows a flat spot where the golden calf might have been placed for all Israel to see. Below the rocks is where Aaron would have made an altar to this golden calf. Okay, some more on it. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a golden calf or a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. So Moses was on top of Mount Sinai for 40 days and this event happened while Moses was away. Now interestingly, this golden calf was a representation of the Egyptian false god, Hathor. It was one of Egypt's main gods. You can see images of this false god that look very similar to the paintings on these rocks here. There are also many other inscriptions on these rocks as well. Now worship of this false god Hathor consisted of dancing, drums, and sexual promiscuity. And this is exactly what the Israelites were doing while Moses was away. This altar, interestingly, is fenced and gated like other archeological sites at the base of this mountain by the Saudi government. However, over the past several years, the Saudi government has opened up these sites to tourists and you can now go there easily and see these places for yourself. Okay, so <clears throat> he received of them their hand, their old golden earrings and other things. He fashioned it with a graving tool after he'd made it a molten calf until, and then they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, verse four, it's brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, found it. And there, by the way, later on we'll see it, there are actually menorahs or a menorah that was etched in the stone. It's the Israelis. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. <clears throat> Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow, it's a feast of the Lord. And so they rose up early on the morrow and they offered burnt offering and brought peace offerings. And the people all sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, go, again, Yalak, go down, go away. Get thee down for, note this carefully, thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. And they, how many of you guys have come home and your wife says, your son... Anybody been through that? I'm going to ask you to dime out your wife. Or you come home, ladies, and he goes, your daughter, right? We're having this sort of shuffleboard game where the Lord is pushing to Moses, the children of Israel, and Moses will push the children of Israel back to the Lord. And this is something that goes on through the five books of Moses, in case you're not aware, and it's actually it's sometimes very interesting to watch. But right now, apparently, they're Moses' people. Your people brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves, and they've turned aside, verse 8, quickly out of the way. How about within uh, 40 days? 
Turn aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them, and they have made them a molten calf. Was it because Aaron saw cherubim when they had that meal with the Lord? Or was it because of the influence of Egypt? Something we're going to ask Aaron when we get to heaven. Which was it? Once again, you can get the people out of Egypt, but it's hard to get Egypt out of the people. Molten calf, and they've worshipped it, and have sacrificed there too, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. Behold, it is a stiff-necked people. <gasps> Did he not know? Look, this isn't like he's at a used car lot and he buys something, pays cash, drives off, gets five miles away and all the dash lights come on, check engine, oil, boom. Like, <coughs> you know, this isn't like he just got sold a lemon. He didn't know it. He says again, he knows the end from the, he knew this about them. Why did he pick them? Well, back to God revealing himself in this test. His ways are not our ways. His grace is something we barely understand at times. We all want it, but we don't really understand it. You mean he knows about my failures I'll make? Yep. He loves me anyway? Yes. Well, then I'll just go ahead and make them. No. No, no, no. Abiding is you bear fruit, not you become a thorn. He knew. I've seen these people. They're a stiff-necked people. Hang on to that thought. Moses is going to play that quite well later with him, but I've, they're a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath, that's off, anger, nostrils flaring, my wrath may wax hot against them that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. What is this? It's a test of Moses. Now, I want to point out something. In just a few verses, which we will get to, don't panic. In just a few verses as we go through this, had the test that we're having right now happened there, I think it might have been a different outcome. So even the timing where God allows you to be tried or tested is divine. He knows you're not ready for this now. And he knows at other times, okay, you don't think you're ready, but you're ready to be tested with this one. So here comes this test to Moses of, I'm just going to smoke him. We're going to start over with you, Mo, children of Mo. He's of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, I mean, the promise is still there. And, and for Moses, the temptation might be, you're going to make a great nation. huh? Uh, how great? <laughs> right? <laughs> Moses besought the Lord. He passes this test. He said, Lord, why dost thy wrath wax hot against, here comes the shelf aboard, thy people, which thou hast brought forth, sliding them back into the Lord's side of the court, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a great hand and with, with great power and a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Why would you let your enemies talk that way about you? Your reputation's at stake. Turn, that word is shub. You try it, shub. How many like Psalm 23? He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. That word is shub. Turn, turn back, turn again, return. To return, to come back. Turn or come back from thy fierce wrath and repent, this is nakam, the idea is to be comforted or turned. See, here's the thing. People read this and they go, well, see, that's it. God's doing evil. Whoa, 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 whoa. God is light. In him there is no shadow of turning, no darkness at all. He tells us he cannot even be tempted with evil. James chapter 1, verse 13 says, let every man, when they're tempted with evil, realize God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither does he tempt anyone with evil. Evil gets tempting to you because of your own flesh. You bite that hook. And so this idea of God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. But you got to convey what's going on in some kind of language, and this is what's available. So this idea of evil can be 442 times evil, wickedness, uh, 18, 59 times, wicked, 25, mischief, 21, hurt, 20, bad, 13, trouble, 10 times, sore, 9 times, affliction, 6 times, ill, 5 times, inadvertently, 4 times, favored, 3 times, but it was sort of an outlier there, harm, 3 times, not, 3 times, noisome, 2 times, grievous, 2 times, and sad, 2 times. No matter which one you pick, it doesn't sound good. Turn from this sad, noisome, inadvertent, whatever, hurting, mischief thing, Repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom you, thou swearest, by thy own self, it was your word, not Moses's, 
This is a key again in knowing how to pray for people. It says God desires all men and women to come to the knowledge of the truth. It says in Ezekiel 18, God takes no pleasure or delight in the destruction of the wicked, but that the wicked might turn. Talks about how there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So when you are praying for someone like, Lord, this guy needs to get saved. Are we praying according to God's will? Yeah, he's made that clear. Well, then when they get saved then? Because he's not going to force them. But knowing what God's word says makes you a far more effective person in prayer and also dealing with things in your life. So here Moses hits the Lord back with his own word. You swore by your own self to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You said to him you would multiply their seed. How's Moses doing in his test? Really good. You said you'd multiply them as the stars of heaven. And all this land you've spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And so the Lord, Nacham, turned direction, go back, the only way we can describe, repented of the sad, bad, whatever, insufficient, whatever those words were, of which he thought to do unto his people. And Moses turned, figuring he had solved the problem. Moses turned and went down from the mount. Can you see it now in your mind as we showed you the footage? Turned and went down from the mount. The two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both on their sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. So written on front and back. So now, back to those cocktail parties, when you're trying to whip up some kind of trivia, bring up Ten Commandments, if they show you only one side written, you can say, there you go. Just trying to help you have conversation. And the tables... Verse 16, were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. He did it, in fact, with his own finger, we're told. And he wrote there, he made the heavens and the earth in six yom, days. I believe him. You go home and wrestle with it. I believe him. It's just easier. Works of God, plus there's lots of evidence, but that was Genesis. Do you want me to go back? No. No, get out of Exodus, you turkey. By the way, turning on the Sheree Boulevard this morning, Six wild turkeys. Right there, turn on the right, Sheree, right on the right side. They're all staring at you like, like we're in their way. You know, turkeys are, anyway, six. So if you're wondering about Thanksgiving, just not saying you should hunt, just, just go in there with a billy club. I'm kidding. See, I'm going to get emails. You say awe, and then you have Thanksgiving. <laughs> Which is it? Stay on the script. Yeah, okay, stay on the, stay on the script, y'all. They were the writing of God, graven upon the tables. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, remember Joshua was part of the way up waiting, 40 days. You think your boss takes a while. 40 days, Joshua, as he comes down, he heard the noise of the people as they shouted. And he said unto Moses, as he finally sees Moses, like, yeah, we got a problem. There's the noise of war in the camp. And Moses said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Ha-ha! That's a shout for mastery. Back in the day when the first generation of kids were in our house, and Gen 1, as we call them, Gen 1, Gen 2, and technically Whitney's Gen 3. She's in a class by herself. But Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3. Back with Gen 1, remember those days when all your kids are small? So you didn't have after-school sports, part-time jobs, team snapped, seeing practices canceled, but now it's back on. But no, it's canceled. Oh, no, it's back on. You're like, right? Am I the only one? I drove, I was on the late bus at 4.30. There was one bus. Dropped you off near the neighborhood. Start walking. <laughs> now they won't even let you cross the street. Anyway, back to this idea of one who cries for mastery. What we would do to kill the time to get to bedtime is I would play hide and seek with the, with the four kids. And uh, this is when we moved in the house in 98, 99. So Jared, we moved in, was born right after we moved in, uh, coming up now on yeah, his birthday. So he was less than a year, kind of like a little, like a snuggly, just a little guy. He just kind of hangs in your hands, right? He's kind of still learning to get all his strength and everything. And, and so uh, the girls would go hide, and then I'd go find them, and then it'd be my turn, and they'd have to count, and I'd go hide. And so they'd be one, two. And so I decided to run up into the kids' bathroom and hide in the shower and <laughs> pull the curtain. And a lot of times they couldn't find me, so I'd have to give a clue. <laughs> and you're like, boop, 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 boop. they'd start looking, he's upstairs, you know. And then they got close, I'd be like, oh, he's downstairs, boop, 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 you know. <laughs> and so I just, what? It's good exercise. You're still stuck with a turkey thing, aren't you? 
So we go up and down, and, and eventually they'd be like, Dad, you know, and so they, so they isolate the fact they think I'm in the bathroom, and of course, you're there holding the baby behind the shower curtain, and you know they're coming for you. What do you do? As soon as they're right up front, you whoom, throw it out of the way, go, ha ha, right? And I'd always do that when they found me, so they'd be looking for me like, you know, <laughs> not sure they want to find me, right? Ha ha, they'd, I'd hop out. Well, when I did that, Jared, who's less than a year, his little bottom lip shoots out, and he goes, boop. And he just burst into tears, like, ah! I'm like, it's okay, buddy. We're just playing hide and seek, you know? He won't play anymore. <laughs> That's a shout for mastery. Moses says, it's not a shout for mastery. He said, there's war in the camp. No, that's not a shout of those who shout for mastery, high hand in the battle. Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. That sounds something like, ha, ah, that kind of thing, right? Where you just, you're dead. We're going to die. You know, that's being overcome. Not a good sound. That's not what I'm hearing. I hear the noise of them that do sing, do I hear. Yay, yay, they're having a party, a big party. And it came to pass as soon as Moses came nigh unto the camp, remember they're seeing that declining video there of going through, that he saw the calf, one. Two, the dancing. Three, Moses' anger waxed hot. Oh, it's his turn now. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath them out. Why not? They've nicely got another God beside the Lord God of Israel. They made a graven image and they're bowing down to it and they're fornicating. So that's adultery. Plus they've been coveting while they figure out who to fornicate with. Uh, well, what's the point? And he just breaks the tablets. Now back to that testing and timing thing. Had God said, now the Moses, Moses, stand back. I'm just going to smoke them. I'm going to make a new nation of you. Had it happened here, Moses would have looked out and gone, smoke him. <laughs> he sees all this happening. He took the calf which they had made and he burned it in the fire. He ground it to powder. powder. You saw that round circle in that stone there. It looks like it's probably where they ground it. Strawed it upon the water. There are streams coming down. If you look at the high def video, you can see the stream beds. It's all there. It's all there for evidence. Strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink it. So much for your big God you're worshiping, you just drank him as an energy drink. And Moses said unto Aaron, what? What did this people do unto you that you've brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, you know what, we're out of time. Let's get it next week. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be evil, I'm just out of time. Ha ha, let's, let's stand and let's pray. Yes, I've already heard I'm terrible on the left side. <laughs> Lord, we're going to meet some of these people in heaven. And I'm so grateful you have not recorded our incredible blunders we've done while knowing your truth. Thank you for the grace of God. Lord, I, I want to pray specifically if anybody's sitting in this room, they're living in something that completely, absolutely, clearly denies your word. They are fornicating with their girlfriend or their boyfriend or their fiance, or they are caught up in a same-sex relationship or drunkenness or drug use or embezzling from work. And they have been justifying why you're okay with it now. I ask that they would take this warning to heart before you have to correct them. They would correct themselves. And they would come back to that place of sensing your presence, that sweet joy, that peace of knowing we're not perfect, but we're definitely trying to abide. That's a whole different world to be in. The righteous are as bold as a lion. The fearful run for no cause because they know they're guilty. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be with us and strengthen us as a church as we're in some very strange days. Boy, oh boy, would we love to be taken home suddenly in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, the voice of the archangel, sound of the Lord, trumpet of God. But until then, Lord, may we not deny your name and may we keep your word that people can see we've been with Jesus. I do pray for anyone that doesn't know you. Let today be the day. With their mouth, they confess you as their Savior. With their heart, they believe you rose from the dead. You tell us in Romans 10, if they'll do that, right where they stand, they will be saved. And to any who receives them, to them you'll give them power to be sons and daughters of God, to those who believe. 
So Lord, be with your people today. Thank you for these things. And uh, Lord, for next week, may we get the air conditioning fixed. In Jesus' name, amen.